United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. All righty. Good evening, everyone. Um, is there a motion to approve minutes from the last public business meeting? So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any additions or deletions to the agenda? No, sir. Okay. Moving into our presentations tonight, um, item number one is a general election update with our uh, election administrator, Ms. Diane Loebel. Welcome. Good evening. Hi, Diane. Hi. All right. Just a brief synopsis of what's going on. Uh, the vote by mail applications were put into the mail this week, and they have started showing up in people's mailboxes. Um, we are asking if you want to vote by mail, uh, don't wait till the last minute to complete your application. Please get it into us as soon as possible. The deadline for the applications are October the 20th, and that is a um, received deadline, not a postmark deadline. Um, the drop boxes, we're going to have two this time for the general election. There'll be one here at the county office complex and then one at Mountain Ridge High School. Um, you can expect to see them sometime the first week of October. Early voting um, will be here at the county office complex in room 100. And the dates for early voting will be October 26th through November 2nd. The hours are going to be from 7 a.m. until 8 p.m., and that is for eight straight days, including the weekend. On Election Day, we will have six vote centers here in the county, one being here in the county office complex, uh, one being at Ford Hill High School, one being at Flintstone Volunteer Fire Department, Allegheny High School, Mountain Ridge High School, and Westmar Middle School. Uh, the hours of the vote center will be from 7 a.m. until 8 p.m. on election day as well. And just one little comment for those voters who want to vote in person, um, please expect to stand in line. We do have to do the social distancing, so you're going to be spaced six feet apart waiting in mm -hmm. line. And we do have to clean each piece of voting equipment after Everybody uses it. So as somebody goes away from a voting booth, we do have to clean that. We have to clean everything each time. So that is going to cause a little bit of a delay. Okay, I just want everybody to be aware of that. And you do need to wear a face mask upon entering the vote center or the early voting center. Okay. Great. All right. Diane, thank you for everything. Oh, Mr. Wilmot. Uh, I need your question. Isn't it, I think in it, uh, you, you, you mail in ballots, they only count if there's not, when there's a certain distance between the voting. I know I, I served in the military, and they told us that my votes only counted whenever there was a, a real close a vote. That's not true. In Maryland, we, we open each and every, um, I can't say absentee anymore, vote by mail ballot. Well, I, that's been about 30 years ago for me. So, thank Great. You, thank you. D Diane, thank you, especially for getting those two other uh, voting locations. I know you had to go to the state and get that approved. You're welcome. And uh, we, we appreciate it, and I know the voters will. And, uh, and you can vote at any one of the six, so you don't have to vote at the one that's, that's closest to you. You can, you can pick and choose. That is correct. You so can go wherever you want to vote. You, you can make it as difficult on, on her as you want. So. <laughs> Trust me, this is so the no most difficult voting. election ever. That's right. Let's pray for a landslide. And, and Commissioner, just real quick, a big thanks to Diane, her and her staff of just a couple have been moving with this thing as it's changed on her four, five, six, seven, I don't know how many times, um, and they keep getting the job done. So big kudos to them. Thanks, Diane. Great, thanks. Okay, moving into our public hearings tonight. Um, item number two is a, a code home rule bill. Uh, it, it involves a zoning for assembly halls and banquet halls. It's a tax amendment. Uh, Ms. Amy Stonebreaker. Good evening. So I'm here tonight um, as part of the public hearing um, for Code Home Rule Bill number 
1-20, a bill entitled An Act to Amend the Zoning Text in Chapter 360 of the Code of the Public Local Laws of Allegheny County, Maryland, to define banquet halls and assembly halls. So just to give you a little background, the reason why we're doing this is because we've had some interest expressed from developers over the years for um, developing properties for banquet assembly halls. So we didn't really have any language in our regulations to um, govern us on, on how to, um, you know, to have a, an assembly or a banquet hall. So staff identified the need to generate regulations for this type of use. So the goals um, were to determine which zoning districts, banquet halls, assembly halls are, assembly, um, are permissible, prohibited, and subject to Board of Appeals. Um, we also had to determine the applicable development standards for banquet assembly halls. So um, I'll try to keep this as brief as possible. Um, but, but anyway, so the definition, um, any place of business maintained for public rental for the purpose of private party events, whether family group or corporate nature, where access by the general public is restricted and with or without the sale, serving, or consumption of food and or alcoholic beverages. That's the definition that's going to go in the regulations under 360-59. Um, under um, Table 1, Table of Permissible Uses, this just explains what's going to be permitted and um, permissible um, with conditions <laughs> not permitted or permissible and through a special exception with conditions. So the X um, in R1, R2, and I, um, it's prohibited. Assembly halls, uh, banquet halls are prohibited. B1, B2, and GU, permitted with conditions. And A and C, special <coughs> exception with conditions. So just to give you a little um, rundown on the conditions associated with bank banquet assembly halls, Again, they're permitted in B1, B2, GU districts, special exception by the Board of Appeals in the A and C districts. Um, they are subject to 360-135 um, general development standards. There's a 50-foot screening buffer required um, along the side and rear lot lines in the A and C districts. Um, they must conform to off-street parking. Um, new and existing farm structures being constructed and or renovated as a banquet assembly hall are not agricultural structures. Therefore, they have to conform to the building code. Um, projects um, shall also conform to the commercial, industrial, and institutional development standards and um, may be subject to a site development plan review approval process. So um, the Planning Commission heard these regulations back on May 20th, 2020, through digital meeting format. Um, we received zero comments um, when there were public notices put in the Cumberland Times newspaper about the regulations, the proposed regulations. We had a, our public hearing on June 17th, 2020, again via digital meeting format. The Planning Commission um, made a recommendation for the Board of County Commissioners to hear and or enact on the proposed regulations at the June 17th meeting <coughs> or hearing. And so um, the Board of County Commissioners um, were introduced to the regulations on July 23rd at a public meeting. Um, and then again tonight, we're having our public hearing on these regulations. There were notices of the public hearing um, and the regulations published in the newspaper on August 7th and the 14th of this month. And to date, staff have received zero comments on the proposed regulations. Any questions? No. Danny? Yes, ma'am. They just refer to new structures. You've got a whole bunch of fire department people here that all have halls and, and do banquets and dinners. Are they like grandfathered? We're good to go? Or? I believe fire halls would be something that's set aside to different um, than what's proposed, um, where you have like farms. Um, that are being converted into um, establishments for weddings. So if we've all been had our halls and yes, halls right, and that's and all that, we're good to go. Right. I want to hear a yay or a nay. Not Mi like, okay. Mr. Williams, the, the fire halls fall under the inst under the institutional, uh, and, and so they previously been covered under the zoning. This would this would fall into situations where there's not a, an institution like a fire hall attached right. to it. Okay. So Thanks. so fire halls are good. Thank you. And we currently have one that's proposed in Allegheny County, and they're waiting on these regulations. Great. Okay. Well, this is a public hearing. Are there any public comments? All right. Um, 
are we taking action tonight or we'll wait till the next meeting commissioners this is this is a legislative day uh so we've had our public hearing you you may take action if you desire great is there a motion so moved second all in favor aye, aye. great okay item number three is code bill 2-20 it's Thank a general you, general obligation bond uh project authorization administrator bennett Thank you, commissioners. Um, as you know, back on August 6th, we introduced um, this bond bill to you, and it's for authorizing us for up to $40 million um, to refinance our general obligation debt. Um, so we think with the, with the market where it is right now, we can save approximately a million and a half dollars over the next few years. Um, it would shift our debt out just a couple years. Um, but with, with cuts looming, we, as we know from the state, and revenues declining, um, a lot of other counties have made this move, and we, we think it's a good time to make the move. So um, what we're going to do, is, if this goes through tonight, we'll do the hearing. If there's no comments, hopefully we can get you to take action tonight so that we can get to the bond market um, by mid, mid to late October to get these while, while the rates are still good. So great, significant savings, like I say, so we don't have to make drastic cuts. This is a public hearing. Is there any public comments on the, uh, the bond refinance and the authorization? Okay, we can take action tonight. Um, is there a motion to uh, to move forward on our uh, bond refinance? So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Great. Thank you. All right. Item number four, known to our action agenda. Um, Resolution 20-12 is the Rocky Gap slots allocation um, for calendar year 2020. Uh, Administrator Bennett. So, so as you know, we've, we've been doing this for several years now. Um, as of required by law, uh, we have a local development council that, that rec makes recommendations on how we spend um, our Rocky Gap slots proceeds. Uh, that, that group met back in December and uh, got a little delayed then with COVID. So we're just reconvening um, last week. Uh, we're here tonight to recommend the, the calendar 2020 um, changes to you. And actually, the changes are very small. We really only rolled the, the program forward for a year. So we made no changes at, at this point, including the scholarships. Um, fire companies stay in place. And if you don't mind, I'll, I'll rattle down through it super Please. quickly. Um, our estimate for revenues was about $2.4 million. Um, this will give nonprofits and municipalities um, a little over 400,000, Allegheny College of Maryland, 360,000, Frostburg State, 200,000, both of them would be for the scholarships. Um, PEGO here at the county and Board of Education Capital would both get 80 grand. Um, Allegheny County Law Enforcement would get uh, $50,000, and our fire companies would get approximately a million dollars um, split evenly amongst them, um, w with Allegheny County EMS getting any, any remainder from the percentages. So um, as I always remind you, state law reads that um, a county or municipality uh, shall make the best efforts to accommodate these recommendations. So, so essentially the council's made these recommendations at this point. Um, it's for your, for your approval tonight. And if so, we'll, we'll get these dollars rolling immediately. Great. And uh, you know, there was some talk about uh, ending the opportunity scholarship uh, when, before when they met in the spring. And, and I'm glad that they're continuing that. Um, and they found a way to, to fund that for at least another year. Um, I want to thank everyone that served on that group because it is a lot of time. And uh, they're going to have their work cut out for them here in a few months when they have to do 21 um, just because the casino revenues are down so much. So Yeah, and I will um, note we lost about $600,000 from, from COVID right. from the casino being shut for three-plus months. Right. Well, Great. Gentlemen, any, any discussion on this? No, sir. Is there a motion? So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank Great. you. Okay. Item five is a resolution about the rules and regulations governing employees of Allegheny County Government. Uh, Ms. Christy Liller. Good evening and good evening, Commissioners. Um, I'm here this evening to request approval of Resolution 20-13, which is a temporary revision to rules and regulations governing employees of Allegheny County. With the current COVID-19 situation, our Board of Elections has had uh, difficulty finding um, sufficient volunteers to assist with the upcoming election um, and voting process. Um, so therefore, along with the Board of Elections, I'm requesting that we make a temporary revision to the poll workers section 5.206 of rules and regulations of Allegheny County 
to make an increase from eight hours of time off to 16 hours of time off um, for any county employees who, work, who are working the election period. Um, this is a temporary revision only, um, and it will run through the current election period only for this year. So at this time, I'm requesting your approval to make this temporary revision to section 5.206 of rules and regulations. Great, gentlemen. I think it makes a lot of sense. Obviously, with the obstacles uh, they're facing this year. With that being said, sir, I'll make the motion. Second. All in favor. Aye. Aye. Thank you, Commissioner. Thanks, Christine. And, and why don't we reach out to, to the Board of Ed as well and, and just let them know what we did and see if they want to they wanna mirror it. Yes, Great. Okay, moving to the consent agenda, uh, Administrator Bennett. So eight items on your uh, consent agenda tonight, Commissioners. Item number six is um, a MOU for the Allegheny County Board of Elections for early voting and election day here at the county office complex. Item seven is a request for tax abatement for the city of Cumberland for a, a blighted property. Um, item number eight is the, the fiscal year 21 and fiscal year 20, federal fiscal year 20, homelessness solutions program grant agreement. Item nine is a MOU um, for the Borden Tram Road project with the state of Maryland. Item 10 is uh, Allegheny County Transit Bus Service Agreement with Frostburg State University in the amount of $125,000. Item 11 is repainting and miscellaneous repairs at the old depot train station bid award in the amount of $39,150. Item 12 is declaration of surplus property. And item 13 is St. Peter and, and Paul Cemetery Monument Repair um, Award in the amount of $2,000. Great, is there any discussion on the consent agenda? Is there, no discussion. Is there a motion? So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. Um, any comments, uh, Administrator Bennett? Nothing further. Attorney Beeman? Nothing further. Commissioner Caprell? Nothing tonight, thank you. Sir, I am good. Yeah, we'll, we'll just, uh, we have a lot of people signed up to speak tonight. Um, so if, if you could just please say, say your name, um, address, and uh, uh, try to keep it at around five minutes if you could. Um, so first up, we have Mr. Uh, Scott Yates. Good evening, Commissioners. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, I live at 626 White Avenue in Cumberland, and I want to address for a minute the EMS system in Allegheny County, and you're going to hear a lot of other speakers addressing the same thing due to some current events that have happened here lately. Uh, I'm going to give you my opinion, and this is my opinion only, and I'm not speaking for anybody else. My opinion is that at this point in time in Allegheny County, we're operating two EMS systems. We have the volunteer system, which has been in decline for several years. And I think everybody here that's gonna speak agrees to that fact. And it's not a result of any one organization or any individual. It's just the world we live in today. The volunteerism across the world in every facet of volunteerism is declining. So we now create a career system to supplement the volunteers. That system currently has problems also. It's underfunded, it's understaffed, and it's not able to meet the burdens of supplementing the volunteers because of the lack of resources. Each year we're spending hundreds of thousands of dollars into our volunteer system that continues to decline. Now we have the career system that is failing because we're not funding it and we're not adequately staffing it and they can't meet the burdens that are being asked of them. So at some point in time, the county commissioners, being the ultimate responsibility, need to take a look at both systems, see what's working, what's not working, make decisions that are gonna provide the best service to our communities ensure they're receiving the services that we need to provide and be fiscally responsible with county taxpayer money. They're tough decisions. That's why you guys were elected as the county commissioners and those decisions need to be made regardless of how it affects political aspirations. Thank you. 
Thank Great. you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, up next, we have Mr. Matt uh, Mc McMoran. My name is Matt McMoran. I reside at 112 Hill Street, Frostburg, and I'm the fire chief of the Frostburg Fire Department. I appreciate the opportunity to address you all. Uh, the committee may or may not be aware the Frostburg Fire Department uh, does not provide EMS services. We are suppression only. While I certainly support DES EMS units in Frostburg, I cannot speak specifically to the items you're about to hear from Facebook and uh, on the agenda. However, I would like to take just a couple minutes to comment on the services and support that the FFD does uh, receive from DES. And I am speaking for the department, not just for myself. The FFD is not the busiest fire department in the county. We don't run the most fire calls. But we do protect the largest target hazard in the county, larger than the hospital, the prisons, anything. And that's a 47-building campus that is home to 5,000-plus students, faculty, and staff that attend and work at Frostburg State University. It's a city within a city, and we have a very strong relationship with FSU, in part because we're over there every week working on initiatives. And it almost always includes someone from DES. Two things I'd like to talk about FSU. We just wrapped up changing all of the street names and addresses for the entire campus. And that was in large part due to Amy and to Director Bennett. Uh, as you can imagine, currently, or prior to this recent change, everything was dispatched as one address. You can imagine that could be a problem for someone in my business, even for the pizza delivery boy. But these guys drove that, and, and now things are going to be better on campus because of that initiative. Um, most of the buildings don't have a Knox box, which to me is crazy. Um, we have to rely on an FSU PD officer to arrive with a key. And in the case of emergency, minutes mean everything. If we need to take the door, of course we will. But again, Director Bennett is pushing that initiative. Um, we're working with the new director of facilities on campus. The new dorm, the new hospital type building will have it. But we are going to try to retro every building on campus by the end of 2021, starting with the dorms. Um, the new dorm alone has 411 students. It's twice the size of the hospital. So it's important that these initiatives are done. And again, it's driven by DES. Um, so I can't thank them enough. The last thing I'd like to highlight is the SAFER program. I realize that many in this room don't get the benefit of this program. Um, and it's had some glitches. It, you know, uh, some of the members of the SAFER group, they have to learn my apparatus my fire trucks or my pumpers. We can get through that and we have. Um, they have to get familiar with that. Um, but it's absolutely a benefit to the city of Frostburg and to the fire department. The safer staff augment my already depleted crews, especially in the daytime. Um, and again, between Chief Biggs, Director Bennett, and others at DES, it's working. I only wish it could be expanded. Uh, in closing, I have 35 years with the FFD, and I can personally attest that during many of those years, Going back to the days of civil defense, <clears throat> communication and collaboration with local FDs was sometimes non-existent, and I'm being kind there. That's not the case today. I'm happy to share with this committee that my personal dealings and those of the Frostburg Fire Department with this agency are incredibly positive. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. OK, up next, uh, Mr. Eddie Collins. Uh, thanks for the opportunity to speak in front of you. Uh, just give you a little intro about myself. Uh, I'm sorry, you need my address. 13424 New Oakland Drive in Cumberland. I'm the fire chief of Bedford Fire Department. Uh, I've been the chief there. This is my third year as deputy chief for two years prior to that. This is my 15th year there. I'm a career fireman in Prince George's County, which uh, some of you may or may not know is the 14th busiest department in the United States, and it's the largest combination of career and volunteer in the country. With that being said, I kind of see the career volunteer issues here as I do at work. Here it seems a lot more 
because it's not a county-wide system. Where I work, it's county-wide. EMS chief at work comes in, says this is what we're going to do. Well, that's what you're going to do today. The fire chief comes in, says this is what you're going to do today. At the authority of the county executive, well, that's what you're going to do today. Here it's not like that. That's the problem. I'm not saying that this is never going to be a county-wide system because at some point it's going to have to be. Volunteers are declining. This year, six months ago, my department implemented a career driver that we pay for ourselves. We asked for this county four times over the last three years to help us out on days that we know we have an issue. They can't do it because it's financially not beneficial for the county to staff that. So over the last three years, we've saved, come up with a budget to make this happen ourselves. So getting into what you're going to hear about, I'm sure, after me, I'm not going to comment on Company 52 stuff because it's, I'm fire suppression only. We don't have an ambulance. I'm not going to comment on the billing because we don't deal with that either. What I am going to comment is I'm not disagreeing and I'm not going to say that I agree with everything that happens in this county because I'd be lying to you. But whenever I sit and read stuff that's blatantly wrong and misleading to the community, then I feel I have to say something. Whenever Chief Biggs and Director Piles implemented the EMS lieutenants, what, a year ago? About a year ago? This is probably the best thing that could have happened. Chief Biggs cannot oversee all the career staff every day by himself and deal with the other issues that he has to deal with. This is creating a chain of command which needs to be followed. Every time there's an issue, which is what happened before with the previous administration, they would go and run to the director. Director Piles, Chief Biggs, they have implemented a chain of command, putting in the EMS lieutenant, which takes them out, lets the EMS lieutenants deal with the issues in the field, and if it needs to go further, then they report to them. So don't let anyone tell you that the EMS lieutenant is not a good thing. And whenever you got one medic running the whole east side, that EMS lieutenant comes in handy. You got Flintstone, they can 25 minute arrival time. So 25 minutes from their station, you're looking at 45, 50 minutes just to get to the hospital. You're sending one medic. Well, now you're sending two. And being a medic myself, that comes in handy, especially on a hot call. So I'm um, going to get into the take home cars. I saw that. There was uh, some comments made about that. Any jurisdiction I've ever worked in outside of Allegheny County, the chiefs and the directors utilize take-home vehicles. This allows them, Chief Biggs, director, deputy director, whoever it is, if there's a major large-scale incident, to get to the scene fast and do their jobs. Um, let's see here. What else I got? Saw... So, um, some remarks regarding the deputy director responding on a fire call. He's the deputy director of emergency services. He can respond on whatever call he wants. That's his job, is to oversee the operations in Allegheny County. Um, I want to touch up on some misleading information again that I've seen about county equipment being housed at Station 17. Special Operations is not a self-sufficient department. It never has been. Company 48 is comprised of the following companies. Company 1, which is Cumberland, Company 2, LaVale, Company 3, Bedford Road, Company 8, Bowling Green, 9, Crescent Town, 17, Shaft, 19, Barton, and 22 is Westernport. It's been like this for 15 years. We can't continually to keep all equipment in a non-centralized location. So the chief that you guys hired has since dispersed that equipment so we can get it on scene faster. It's implemented units and staffing to where we're not waiting 45, 50 minutes like we were before on an ops call. This is nothing new. Um, I just want to say in closing that Bedford Road appreciates the county employees. We appreciate their staffing. Before they were 24-7 staff at Bowman's Edition, my guys were getting on the ambulance almost every call because Bowman's Edition was getting out understaffed, driver only, that wasn't trained. Now they're getting out. They're getting on scene. They're handling the calls. So in closing, we're appreciative of the EMS system. Yes, there needs to be some changes, but I don't see that that couldn't be a reason that a work group could be put together with the combination of the director, the chiefs, volunteer, and career to sit on and discuss the issues. 
like we should be doing professionally, not blasting everyone on Facebook. Because to me, that's defamation, and it's bad for a public image when most of the stuff's not true. So, thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. Thank cool. you. Okay, up next, uh, Mr. Bobby Ritchie. Good evening, my name is Bobby Ritchie. I reside at 14 Church Street in London County, Maryland. So commissioners, ladies and gentlemen of the audience, thank you for the opportunity to speak today. As you have heard already, there's a number of residents and folks here from the EMS and fire departments uh, here about the letters and posts on Facebook and the letters you've received. I reside in London County, I've been there for 45 years. I belong to the Goodwill Fire Company since 1991. I'm currently chief of the fire department. I'm here speaking on behalf of myself and the Goodwill Fire Company. I have a long list of certifications, as many of us do in this room, from firefighter EMT to hazmat collapse, trench, confined space, and rope rescue, just to name a few. As all of us know here, it takes a lot of time to do that as a volunteer. I also belong, or am currently employed, with Fairfax County, Virginia, which is also a combination department. I've been there for 23 years. I'm currently a lieutenant. Just as Eddie had already mentioned, we know how it works with combination departments. This here is a combination department. We're transitioning from the career staff coming in to supplement the volunteers to now we need to move forward to the career staff being supplemented by the volunteers. We don't have enough volunteers, just the same Maloney County or any other volunteer department in the Allegheny County, to supplement all we need. You guys are doing an outstanding job of trying to prevent or provide that to us. Within the combination departments, there's always going to be give and take. Working together, such as sharing equipment, the building, and all of the building, not limiting what we can use or they can use as the career staff within the building. Uh, also, both on the street and off the street, if there's daily dues that need done around the firehouse, as we know in the career staff, if the volunteers are there or the career staff's there, it's both each other's responsibility to make sure those things get done, whether it be watching the fire trucks, watching the ambulances, or whatever. As I mentioned already, Volunteers with career supplements is where it started out many years ago. However, we are now transitioning into a career EMS department with volunteer supplements when they are trying to avoid doing so. This, is, this has also started to transition into the fire departments, as Matt has already mentioned, which is definitely something we're going to need to proceed further with. Uh, as Eddie has already identified where his department is paying for a member or a person to come drive their fire trucks and provide EMS care whenever they need to. So, as we've done with the SAFER grant, this is some place where we need to continue to operate and move forward with additional SAFER grants. That provides us with funding, or provides you, the county, with funding to uh, provide staffing for a period of time at no cost to the county until you have to pick it up later. Something we need to continue is the staffing, covering all shifts in all locations within the county and provide equal care, both BLS and ALS coverage. There's, there will always be a place in Allegheny County for volunteers. It's just not what we're used to. It's going to be a different look, a different sound, and a different make. The working relationship between the volunteers and DES is a must. And I can honestly say the Goodwill Fire Company has a great working relationship with DES, from the director to the EMS lieutenants. From preparing for large-scale events that happen in and around our area, Lone County and EMS, to EMS coverage when the local EMS departments does not have coverage with their in-house paid staff. To name a few things that we've worked hand-in-hand -hand with, with the EDS, the standby coverage for the fireworks events that happened in Lone County, the Lefty Grove dedication, preparing, uh, providing proper PPE for COVID-19, a repeater site to better the communications in the Georges Creek area, radio repairs, EMS coverage with dual dispatch when no local coverage was available, this was all because of having two crews at Station 51 working together with TTEMS. If they had a second crew available, so it wasn't putting a burden on them as well. DES is sitting also on numerous committees with us to help develop new policies and procedures within the county so we progress to change the fire and rescue department where it needs to be in the next century. Fire ground ops and implementing rehab for firefighters and patient care under the direction of the EMS lieutenants. Myself, I can attest to a number of large-scale incidents, both the hotel fire, the apartment fire in London County, and a couple others, where the EMS lieutenant came in, knew the incident command system, knew how they operated. I didn't have to worry about EMS care. I delegated that over to them, 
gave them the EMS group, and they handled it. I didn't have to worry about calling more ambulances or nothing. Just like everybody else has already identified, there is a chain of command. Just like Mr. Shade up here, he's your chain of command. Everybody reports to him, so on and so forth, up to the county exec, right? Same thing to fire departments and the EMS departments. We all have a chain of command. We don't jump around because he hurt my feelings, so now I'm not going to go to. That's the deal. We've got to continue with the chain of command. Um, uh, the other guys have already mentioned about if you have a problem on a call, that EMS lieutenant's who you're going to report that to. The other side of that is, is that we find in our career positions, you still have to notify the volunteer chain of command also. Because if you have a volunteer riding your fire truck or ambulance, then that volunteer chain of command still needs to know what happened. Same thing here. You're still going to notify the lieutenant, and then the lieutenant's going to let him know the EMS chief in his daily report of what happened. Same thing for the career, the volunteer staff. You still need to let them know because they need to handle the same thing so it doesn't happen again. The other thing is, Eddie had mentioned earlier, the lieutenant has upstaffed BLS units a number of times when patient requires ALS care and transport. And the lieutenant's buggy is normally transported to the hospital with somebody else from the fire ground and or from the ambulance, which gets the EMS lieutenant back in service faster. In closing, the county has been doing an amazing job in supporting both the volunteer career staff under the direction of the DES and the Emergency Services Board. I would hate to see things get slowed down and delayed in progress that has been made so far. With anything, there is always going to be room for improvement, as there is here. We're going to have hurt feelings. We're going to not make everybody happy. But we need to continue to look out for the public, the taxpayer, and the people that need help. And that can be done. Just needs better management and better working together with those folks. Thanks for your time. And feel free to contact me if you have any further discussion. Great. Thank, Thank you, you very much, Bobby. Um, and, and I think he, he hit on something very important. You know, as, as we look at our, our role here, we represent the public, um, but we also have, have staff that work for us. So, so we're, we're balancing both of those demands. Um, and, and for me personally, you know, four years ago, we were spending 810000 on on EMS. Now we're spending $4.3 million. So, you know, that, that over $3 million in, in four years has to come from somewhere. Um, and, and so that's, that's kind of the, what, what has started all of this. If, if you don't want to raise taxes or you don't want a special tax, um, but you still want someone to, to show up when you call 911, um, that's the most important thing for us is, is the safety of the community. And, and whether it's a volunteer, whether it's a paid county person or, or whoever, um, someone showing up is, is, is the basic form of what government should be uh, concerned with. So um, I just wanted to add that before we, we continue. Um, up next, we have Ms. Uh, Christy Williams. My name is Christy Williams. I live at 214 Wood Street in Mushroomport. Thank you for the opportunity to speak today. Um, I have been a 23, almost 23 years uh, service with Tritown ZMS. Um, and in fact, Bobby Rich used to be my president. Um, so I know he's very familiar with this. And while I respect the, mm -hmm. uh, respect the fire departments for being here and um, having their say on things, um, coming from the billing aspect of things, how do you expect me to run my department? Uh, I had some questions for Chief Biggs at a recent meeting that Director Powell wasn't able to attend. Um, there was a personal invitation for him to attend my meeting at, held at uh, Tritown ZMS that he wasn't able to do as well. Um, when you have, and we've put this out there before, I know the letter was long, and I really hope that you all took the opportunity to see where the departments are coming from. You have representation here for five, at least five departments across, your, across Allegheny County. Now, if we're telling you something is wrong, something is wrong. So we admit that... The DES has been a great step up for us. We appreciate everything that they've done. A lot of the people that are, that are employees of the county are friends of mine. And it's very unfortunate for the way things have had to go. But quite honestly, what choice do we have in the matter? When you're telling me, when you're sending us a letter that says you have August 1st and that's it, when COVID stopped any kind of meetings for us to have a discussion on what exactly the percentage was going to look like, and you want to talk about working hand in hand, that's what we want. That's what we want, and we didn't get that. 
So I'm not exactly sure what, um, what they think the options were here other than to say, you're going to do this and that's going to be your only option. And that was ex pretty much stated in that letter from Director Powell's. Now, it is not our objection, objective to, um, to get rid of DES. It's necessary. We have, there's not just a decline at Tritown's EMS, there's a decline in members all across the county and all across the nation. So we actively see the, the need to have DES involved. But when, you, when you're not able to look at your budget and budget out properly, and you're expecting that on some of these calls where let's take a Medicaid patient as an example, we get $100 per call and both of your county employees go on that, you wanna take $70. Out of that $30, now keep in mind, we also have to pay for uh, billing. So now out of, out of that $30, we're paying for billing. Now expect me to pay for the gas, expect for the contracts on all of our equipment because the county's not giving us money for that. That's coming out of our pocket. So everything, the amenities that they get at our station, that's coming from what we're paying. So yeah, while we may need to help supplement some of what the county is doing because it's a great service, you can't look at what we're getting and say that that's going to be enough to carry volunteer stations in this county. Now, I don't know how many of you up here have any kind of, if you have any kind of background in fire EMS. I know those that work at the county that don't have um, any kind of background, but I'm, I'm not really certain that um, making a decision where we're not involved in that decision-making process is the right route. Now, the biggest problem that I have that I have right now is that while um, we're here tonight, and I'm sure we're going to hear some responses, is that nobody has come up to say anything to us about this. Now, this was mm -hmm. you're going to take it, you're going to like it, and this is it that's the way it's gonna be. And that's not the way it should be because we want to work hand in hand with the DES, that's the thing. Um, I just don't feel like we are given, we don't feel like we are given that opportunity to do that. Our hands are, our hands are tied by, by this percentage that you guys have authorized while thinking that it sounds like a great thing. And if you have suggestions on what we can do from here, then by all means, but I can't, sit back and not say anything and just allow this to happen because when, and with due res all due respect, when Chief Biggs was questioned on how we're getting in new volunteers, how we're paying our bills, I don't know, Christy, but we'll look into it. I was never gotten back to any of the, any of the questions that I had given at the, had asked at that meeting. And I just feel like um, while Again, I have a lot of respect for the fire departments, and I'm sure that there's a lot of appreciation for them being here. Um, and we do work hand in hand on a lot of the fire scenes, and that's great. Um, but I feel like also when it comes to our billing process, we have to do what's right for our community. Now, Tritown's EMS, because of things that we've gone through in the past, has become a very transparent company. I walk down my street, my member, my community knows who I am, they know where I'm a member at. Somebody like, you know, Biggs walks down the street, they might not know who he is. I don't want there to be all this information out there for, the, for our communities to see what's going on behind the scenes because it doesn't look good on DES and it doesn't look good on our departments. So we don't want that, but we really feel like we have no choice in the matter here. When you're given ultimatums and you're not giving options, there is a problem and it, comes, it starts with leadership. And to not have any kind of, of communication about this to say that they're going to provide any information to us or, um, you know, let's have a meeting, let's get together and talk about this. That's not happened yet. So I'm, I'm not exactly sure how this county, um, whether it's fire departments, DES, volunteers, or our commissioners can say that the, that the billing percentage that was made was correct. Um, when you don't have any kind of information from volunteer organizations. Now, there have been a couple members of rescue squads that have given um, mm -hmm. a percentage to the county, and I'm, I assume that that went to Director Powell's. But again, it was, there was no consideration. There was no discussion. And I think that if, in order for us to proceed here, mm -hmm. um, in order for our, for our areas to have adequate um, 
personnel that are going to cover those areas because Tri-Towns covers a lot of towns and we have a large area so I can only speak for Tri-Towns myself but in order for that to happen we have to have the DES and we appreciate everything that they've done but you can't and then let me just also touch on the lieutenants <laughs> because while they have showed up and they have done a great job on some of our scenes um, and they have been needed the fact that they don't generate an income is a problem for with us because you're asking us to give you money and they're they are we've had to put lights in some of the vehicles for people that don't even run fire EMS calls so I'm not exact we're not exactly sure why uh, that was necessary um, a lot of the a lot of the things is that it's mismanagement of money and if you expect me to run a rescue squad on a budget of four hundred thousand dollars for the area that we have I would like some explanation on why we can't do those things for Frostburg Ambulance Company, which I know is separate from the fire department, I'm well aware. Um, and I feel like uh, in order for this to happen, there has to be a, a meeting that's held that is both fire or both EMS and DES, that there has to be common ground between all of us, mm -hmm. that when I look at look at my bills that have to be paid, then I need to know that what I'm doing is right for my members, right for my community. And I would really like to answer any questions that you guys have because nobody's had any anything to say other than a response to uh, a letter that was posted on Facebook about the naming of Livio Rescue Squad. That's the only response that's been had about any of this. Now you have representation here from Tri-Towns, from LaVale, from, um, I didn't bring my list up with me, but from Corganville, um, even, even though um, at George's Creek Ambulance, they don't have any of the DES uh, employees there, but they're represented here as well. If you can't look at us and tell us that there's no problem here, then you are basically allowing our doors to close because we're passionate about this. I'm very passionate about this. And it wasn't until I took over as vice president that I actually seen a lot of the things that were going on. And I actually feel very sorry and apologize to my, com to my community and to my members of the department that I wasn't fully aware of the things that were going on behind the scenes. So if tonight there's no action taken, you are basically telling us that while we appreciate you being here, thank you for your service, and we'll go from there. So I think a little bit of response to you, and I think Director Powell can maybe elaborate on this once once all the comments are done, just to streamline this. Um, a reminder, we, we've been working at this at the county level for some time. You've seen us escalate the dollars we're spending. Um, we are, I'll remind you, giving a million dollars a year to the fire companies. Um, $800,000 from Rocky Gap goes to, in part, help pay for some of the ambulances and equipment you put on the road. So we, we do our part on that side. Um, I think Director Piles will elaborate. We tried to put together an EMS billing committee to work through some of these problems, and I, I don't think that went too far, and he can talk more about it. Um, so, so we have made effort. We have the same issues on the, the county side. We have to pay the bills. Um, and with, with the service we're providing, we're not getting enough revenue back to, to pay those bills. So what, what we're trying to do here is even, even the playing field a little bit. And it is difficult, without a doubt. So when then is the county going to say, if, if you tell me that you're going to give us money to help supplement some of our bills, then that might be one option. But when the DES, and again, I'm not knocking any of the employees because, again, they're my friends. But when they're sitting there, they're watching our TV, they're using our Wi-Fi, they're using our computers, they're using um, electricity, they're sleeping in the bunk rooms and things. That money is generated through the money that we get from these calls. So if you're telling me, and Westernport serves a, a wider area of Medicaid patients and Medicare patients. so. And not, you know, all the companies have them as well. But the problem is, is that there's no supplement there. And then whenever you find out that somebody asks you on scene, well, did you get the supplies that the county was given? Well, no, mm -hmm. we received 50 masks. So it's great that it's being handed out everywhere else, but that money's coming out of our pocket. 
Tri-Town CMS has gone through the budget for their administrative side and their field operations side on, on supplies for everything that we need to ensure that our ambulances are cleaned after each call and also for the N95s for each of our members, things along those lines. So we've covered those costs, those fees. And again, we're, our budget is, is out the window for this year. So I can't speak for all the companies that are represented, the EMS companies that are represented here today, but I can tell you that Tritown's EMS is, in this, is probably in the same boat that they are all in. That this money is not being given, it's not being funded. You have supplies that are being locked up, and we have to figure out how to get our supplies our own selves. Just one drug, drug um, ordering a few weeks ago was over a hundred and some dollars for one drug. So when you're looking at things like that, that all has to be taken into consideration. And I also don't believe that when they came up with the numbers, which could have been out of thin air, or they threw it in a hat and picked one, the percentage of for us doing the billing is also something that they didn't take into consideration. So that's my two cents on it, and I would I think that we all welcome the comments that we're going to hear from everyone. Um, and we look forward to a day where DES and volunteer stations can work hand in hand, and it's not a defunding of our volunteer organizations. Right. Thank you. I'll, I'll, if you could stay yes. just a second. Um, so 70% so was what, what's currently proposed or in force. Is there a percentage you think that would be fair or? Could, well, one of the suggestions that we had given was 65%. That's if both employees go right. on the call. So while 5% doesn't seem like a big, a big jump, it's the fact that nobody came to the table and said, let's discuss this. Sure. Uh, and, you know, so those were things that we had to do ourselves. Um, we don't want six, really technically 60% would be, would be adequate enough for us to handle all of the billing and all of the ambulance and the contracts that we have. 60% would be the best option for us, for each of these departments to be able to handle all the things that they do. Now, Tri-Towns, and I'll speak for Tri-Towns, we're not in a high tax bracket area. Right. So we don't have the income that other places do. 60% sure. is for both of the county employees to go mm -hmm. on would be an adequate number. Sure. But again, bring it to the table. Have a discussion. That's mm -hmm. not happened. And we want to talk about leadership. This is where leadership starts. Okay. Well, well thank you very much for, for those comments. And. Um, I, I think that, that we can certainly look into that and, mm -hmm. and have a meeting here um, in the short term. I, I will say, you know, and, and, and you hit it on the head, if there's two county employees, it's it's one rate. If there's no county employees, you know, you, you all we get the... keep it all. Exactly. Right. Yeah, so I, I wanted to make sure that everyone knows yeah. that that's how it's set up, or at least that's how it's proposed. Right, so. and um, Chris had stated at a, at a Chief Biggs, sorry, I'll give you the respect, um, <laughs> Chief Biggs had stated at a meeting that they had hired somebody to help with uh, volu the volunteerism in the county, and I believe he said they were here for four years, maybe, um, and only a number of in the teen within the teens of people that actually were had started volunteering. So even something coming up with a way that we can do something in this county to get the volunteers out there—that's the main thing. We start. I started out at 16 years old. And I know a lot of the members in this in this room started out even some of them even younger than that with their parents in, in the departments. But it's necessary that if we're gonna have DES and we're gonna have volunteers, it's one system. We're all in this together. If I have to go pick Betty Joe up off the floor one more time and you're gonna be there with me, great. Because they're seeing you, they're seeing me, they're seeing us. They're not seeing DES and Tri Towns. They're seeing us. And that's the main thing. It's going to give a black eye to this community for all departments, not just the volunteer organizations. Great. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Uh, up next, Mr. Josh Burkett. Good evening. Joshua Burkett, 123 Green Street, Western Port, Maryland. 123? Green. Yes, ma'am. Thank you for the time to speak. Uh, I'm sure everybody's read the post. I'm sure everybody's seen the post on Facebook and everything. This is not the way we want to do this. We started with the EMS 
committee, the billing committee. Anytime you start any of this stuff, it takes time. It's not easy trying to get all departments together, draw everything in. <coughs> County's pretty dynamic. Different departments have different billing capabilities. Smaller departments, larger departments. Trying to get something that works for everybody is pretty hard. We were working on it. COVID hit. We couldn't work on it any further. Everything's been stopped. Then we get the billing rates come out. There is no way, absolutely no way, that these departments can survive with the current billing rates. Every department, EMS department, will be shut down with the billing rates. I cannot overstress that enough. I cannot say it ain't planar. That is going to shut them down. DES will pick up, I guess, maybe in different areas. The dynamics of the county. I've been a provider in this county volunteer for since 2000. I have started out tri-towns, taken a call. I've transported to PVH. I have been sent to Crescent Town to do a medic assist. I've went there, picked up a patient, transported to Western Maryland. I've left there. I've been in the city, went back, went to Frostburg. I have been all over this county. You cannot do this with just a few ambulances in this county. There's not possible. The EMS stations that are out there are out there for a reason. They're in the places where they need to be. Yes, you can look at it and everything, write it down, okay, well this day they had one call. You look a month down the road, we had 15 calls. It's dynamic, it's going to change, it's going to continue to. People are going to go without ambulance coverage or they're going to wait for ambulance coverage. Sometimes I would suspect anywhere of 25, 35 minutes. I know I don't want to get the calls. I wouldn't want to be you guys. I appreciate the fire departments. Uh, I'm glad that they do have an open line of communication with DES. I can't say as I do. If I call a lieutenant, I ask a question, they have to call Chris Biggs. I usually want to talk to Chris Biggs. He winds, winds up going higher. There's no hierarchy or anything to get answers quick for anything. I know a lot of fire chiefs spoke on that. Maybe it works on that side for them. It doesn't work on the EMS side for us. Lieutenants, I understand the reasoning. I don't understand the reason why you cannot put a person on Frostburg to work as a lieutenant and handle personnel issues and everything else while they run the county and everything. That's just more money out of the budget. They aren't generating anything. But then you, we get the budget and everything or we get the billing that we're going to pay, I believe it is 60 for one, 70 for two. As Chrissy spoke, we might get $100 for a bill. I have to pay, if we dump a drug box, there could be anywhere from $100 to $800 on equipment. We have to pay for the billing to be done and everything else. We're going to be lucky if we collect $20. Fuel, wear and tear on the vehicle, ambulance costs anywhere from $150,000 to $250,000. Monitor, $60,000, $70,000. Can't be done. The, the EMS departments will shut down at this billing rate. We would make the recommendation of 60%. I'm not sure the whole thing with the bail rescue squad. I read the same letter that everybody else has. That definitely infuriates me that you're going to pull the crews out of there and make some sort of agreement with the bail fire department. I haven't seen the particulars on that. I've heard enough about them and everything. I've heard that the percentage is going to be paid to the Vail Fire Department and everything. If there's no money in EMS, you're not going to make money at this. There's, there's none. I've done it long enough, been chief long enough. It's not going to happen. But we have to provide the coverage to the citizens. 
We have to help people that are sick. We have to help everybody that we can. That's the simplest way I can put it. But we're going to have to come to the table, and there's going to have to be open negotiations, not one way. I'm the current sitting chairperson of the UMS committee. <clears throat> Director Powell, I believe, has been there twice since he's taken over. Can't get representation. Every time Chief Biggs comes, <clears throat> I appreciate him coming. I'm friends with Chris Biggs. But he takes a lot of notes and doesn't make a lot of decisions on it. Can't. There has to be an open line of communication. There's no other way to do it. You guys have right. any questions for me? Anything? No. No, I'm just listening to what you're saying. I mean, I mean, I, I'm, I'm not an EMS person, so for me to refute yeah. anything, anything, that in, in, and I'm not trying to get into anyone's craw here tonight. Mm -hmm. In 2012, when this started, you know, they said, "Boy, if the county just could come up with $400,000 a year, we could put coverage everywhere in Allegheny County." At that time, we approached Jason as finance director and said. Is there any way we can pull this off and still keep the Rocky Gap monies flowing to every department? Yep. To EMS and fire. I said, yep, and this thing will never grow beyond that. And then when you get to budget this year and it's at $4.3 million. There's a, lot of, there's a lot of waste. And we have highlighted, like I said, the last thing we wanted to do is what we've done. This is not the way we wanted to do this. But there is a lot of waste. But then you come, they come back at us and want this. Whenever I can close my eyes and throw a dart and find the waste, how is that right? That we're going to shut EMS doors, citizens are going to have to wait. Who, who's going to decide who's more important to have the coverage? Yeah. I, I mean, I, I, I'm just asking. I mean, well, I, gosh, there ain't no one up here wants to close no one's door. And, no, I, and, and I'm glad. This is kind of awkward because my chair is sinking to the floor, and as I sit here, I keep getting low. <laughs> I'm not on that. And it threw the mic at you now instead of over the mic, but no problem. We're here to try to get this problem solved. I, 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 and, I truly and hope I, so. I can't be sit here and speak on a professional level because that that would be a downright lie because I'm not. Mm -hmm. I can't stand the sight of blood. I, if someone would come up here towards me with a needle tonight, I'd be laying on the floor. So We're used uh, to that. It's okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, but we're, we are going to get this worked out. One way or the other. I, I appreciate so. that. I would greatly ask that the letter to LaVale be rescinded. I mean, I know yeah. there's issues. There's no department without issues. I think given the time and a little bit of help, I think they can move it around and everything can change it. But to shut their doors like that, that's exactly what it's going to do. And if the billing rates continue this way, there is no station going to stay. I mean, I understand where you guys are coming from. It's hard to find money. I don't want to, I'd like to know how you're going to come up with another $180,000 per ambulance that you don't have right now currently. Yeah. Just for that's per ambulance. And that's you still got another one hundred twenty-five thousand dollars probably just to outfit that ambulance. You're going to have to buy ten, twelve ambulances or something like that. I mean, it's going to be rough. We're here. We want to help. We want to move forward. We want to get this taken care of. I can't stand the same one. Great. Thank. Thank you. No problem. Thank Thanks, you, Josh. Okay. Next Thanks, up, Josh. we have uh, Leanne Abernathy. Thank you for the opportunity to speak. Mm -hmm. We are not, we don't want us versus them. That was never what we wanted. Um, but we feel that our hands were tied because all of a sudden, last month, we come out with 
you're paying 50, 60, 70 percent. And we didn't have a chance because of COVID to finish having this billing committee and our recommendations and our ability to look at all of the finances. And COVID has now, like Christy said, crushed our, our budgets. We understand that you guys need money to fund EMS. And we understand that that money has to come from us for services rendered. We don't have a problem with that. But we have a problem when we are as transparent as possible and then we look at what the, the county is doing and there's, there's waste. You know, the, and, and we'll use the, the take home vehicle since that seems to be the, the thing of, of the night. If you give everybody a take home vehicle, then you've just bought a vehicle, you've just had to now buy tires for it, oil changes for it, fuel for it, but what's the point? The only one of these six take home vehicles that would need one would be Chief Biggs because he's the only one with certifications in order to do his job as chief of, of the EMS service. So we've wasted money there. As far as the county lieutenants go, you can have a supervisor on a shift. But once you put those lieutenants in, the question was asked as soon as they went in, are they going to generate revenue? Are you going to charge us for a lieutenant getting on our ambulance? And the answer was no. They're there to help you. And they're there if we want to cancel them from coming on to the scene because they're not needed. But in the meantime, you're going to waste fuel for that chase car to come from LaVale or Crescent Town to run all the way down to Western Port to help us out. And how many lives have you just put on the line because you're running lights and siren all the way up for nothing? Because the... Uh, the county employees were told that they can't cancel them unless they are at the same level as them for paramedic wise. We're just asking why you want to take more money from us when you have money in this budget that's being wasted. I don't know the actual numbers. Uh, we did put a Freedom of Information Act in to find out what the numbers are for the budget for DES because we wanted to compare. What do they use? How do they use it? Maybe they do things that benefit us. Maybe we can show them how to benefit them. But $846,000 was lost last year at Frostburg Area Ambulance. That's enough to pay for two of our stations because Tri-Town's EMS's budget last year was $463,000. We just want to be able to sit down and have a conversation with DES that we don't feel intimidated, we don't feel bullied, that we're not told straight out at the very first <coughs> billing committee meeting we had, I want 80-20, and if you don't like it, I'll just take your staffing. And that was said. So I, I'm, I'm glad the fire departments are, are, are watching this. Um, and I don't know exactly what what their motives for coming here tonight were. But as far as EMS is concerned, we know that every second counts. And while we are grateful that DES is there and we want to work with DES, we don't want to be bullied either. And, and I'm not trying to say, well, we were here first. That's not the mentality, but we're being shoved aside and that's not fair nor right. Um, and a lot of the community doesn't understand how things are are done at a county level or, in, or a volunteer level. And I've asked this on several occasions, but Director Piles has never talked to the billing company. So he doesn't even know how billing works. So you're going to come at us with a percentage that, how do you even know that that percentage, how, how that revenue is generated? And I know that the waste in this county it, it, it just blows my mind how it's allowed it, it, because we're supposed to be transparent. But I'm an analyst by trade. So I look at trends and I look at numbers and I look at how things are going and this is trending downward fast. So we just ask that you would sit down and all of us come to the table and make them public meetings where everybody in the community can come and see how things work. 
And do you guys have any questions for me? Nothing. No. Th th thank you very much. Thank you, Leanne. All right. Up next, we have Mr. Scott Wetzel. So good evening, thank you uh, for giving me the time to get up here and speak. Um, I've been involved in EMS for about 20 years. I've been in a number of departments, both in this county and then also out of state. So I've, I've had the opportunity to see how uh, departments run. Um, I am currently the acting chief, or the acting captain is our, our title, but it's the equivalent of acting chief for the Vail Volunteer Rescue Squad. Um, and I, I'm in that position because we are short on volunteers. We're not hiding that, we're not lying about that. Um, so we, we've been short for a while. That's what brought us to the ES staffing. Um, our email response to uh, Director Pyle's email clear, clearly put that out there. We are short. We put out you know messages before that we're short on volunteers. We're looking for help. Um, I did have the opportunity to meet with Director Pyle's and Assistant Director uh, Bennett uh, on August the 7th, as he stated. Uh, we came in. We had a brief meeting. Uh, where he was talking about the potential of merging the LaVale Rescue Squad into DES. Um, and I brought up, what about the volunteers? What's going to happen to our volunteers? Uh, and the, the conversation that, or basically where I was left with that at the end, was uh, Assistant Director Bennett was going to get together a proposal, a draft proposal, of how, a, an initial of how this is going to work, how we're going to merge. Um, so that the volunteers can remain providing service to the community, which is what they want to do. Um, the next communication that we got was the email from Director Piles giving us a deadline of September 11th to agree to turn over the keys or he's going to pull our staffing. Uh, whether that was his intention or not, that's how it came across to everybody that read the email, um, mm -hmm. which again is posted out there, so anybody's welcome to take a look at it look at it if you haven't already. Um, so our, our understanding was that September 12th, if we didn't say, here's the building, that we're going to have no staffing. They're going to pull out, move the staffing to LaVale Station, uh, Company 2, Station 2, that they do have an MOU already signed, uh, from what we're being told from members of the fire department. Um, so if we want to talk about numbers, because that, that's the big thing that started all of this um, last year was the, the billing percentages and making sure the numbers are fair. Um, we agree the numbers should be fair on both sides. So the LaVeo Volunteer Rescue Squad runs about 950 calls a year on average. Uh, we bring in, uh, for 2019, we brought in just over $220,000 out of billing revenue. Uh, so if, if you're to take the 50%, the which is um, what we were previously paying, um, our offer to the county for the renegotiation on the MOU, was $105,000 plus an additional $10,000 because we were very fortunate to have DES, DES's support last year as we were having some mechanical issues with our ambulances. They allowed us to borrow a, a DES ambulance to fill in the gaps. So we were going to provide additional as a thank you to the county for providing that service to us because we do appreciate it. Um, you take moving up to 70%, you're going to gain some money. An additional 8% if you close this down, that goes 78%. The county's only looking to gain forty, fifty, sixty thousand dollars $60,000. Now they take 10% is the number that I heard, I could be wrong, to the fire department for rent, essentially, plus they're paying utilities, supplies, maintenance, all the other expenses that are going to come along with that. The $200,000 is quickly going to disappear. It already costs staffing. I believe it's in the neighborhood of $350,000 or so to staff our station. Again, we're reimbursing them about one third of that, give or take. Um, our total operating budget is in the neighborhood of $360,000 a year. Um, and that includes our uh, special taxing district, which we do have, the citizens of LaVale uh, do pay a special tax into keeping us operational. Uh, we do receive county allocations in the amount of around thirty-five, thirty-six thousand dollars $36,000 a year. Um, the Rocky Gap funding uh, did increase 
in the last couple of years after the, the casino opened, gave me money before that was um, in the neighborhood of, I believe, five or six thousand, maybe seven thousand dollars a year. Um, once the casino opened, that added uh, about thirty thousand dollars or so to what we're getting in from the Rocky Gap money. So our we're approximately about 38% of our money is from those taxing. 55% of our money does come from our billing revenue. And then the remainder comes from donations. Um, we do sell medical, uh, some basic medical supplies, stethoscopes, blood pressure cuffs. Um, so, so we do have some local sales um, and other sources is where the, that remainder of our budget comes from. Uh, so in addition to just a straight up cost of what it's going to be to put not one, but I believe the the uh, plan is two paid crews in Lavelle. Um, what are the volunteers saving? So in uh, the last two and a half years, the, the volunteers of Lavelle uh, of the Lavelle Volunteer Rescue Squad have given fifteen thousand hours of time into the rescue squad, um, being able to do all kinds of things. Granted, we're not running the majority of the calls. In two thousand eighteen. <coughs> Um, we were on approximately 30% of the calls. We had volunteer representation and a very small percentage of that. We took the call 100% with volunteers. 2019, that percentage dropped. We were down closer to 20% that we had volunteer representation on the calls. Um, we've appreciated the support that we've gotten from DES over the uh, past several years of, as we've experienced uh, personnel problems. We want to help. Um, we want to find a way to make this work. I personally do believe that a um, countywide volunteer combined system is the way that it's going to have to go. There needs to be a volunteer path in the county. Um, if you look at the county employees, the majority come from the volunteer stations. They got their training from the volunteer stations. So once the volunteer system closes and you go to a countywide paid system, you now have to pay for a training academy because you're not going to have the volunteers training your people you're going to have to have your own academy. So now you're paying academy staff, you're paying your employees while they're in the academy. Um, the current EMT program uh, is going up from 165 hours to 225 hours. Um, that's what we're currently running as the pilot. The class that starts uh, here in two weeks is going to be that, and that's what our last two classes in the county have been, are these pilot programs. So you're looking at eight weeks just for that. Um, once you add in EVOC, which is a requirement to drive emergency vehicles, you're adding in at least another week of training just in the emergency vehicle <coughs> operations. Um, so that is more time that you guys are going to have to pay your employees that aren't actually doing anything to bring you in the revenue or help cover the calls or alleviate overtime. That needs to come from somewhere. So, again, my big thing here tonight is the volunteers can still perform a very good service to the county. Um, again, Assistant Director uh, Bennett and I had spoke, and we've spoken since a couple times that, yeah, we need to find some sort of system that will work where the volunteers can still take part in this county and provide a meaningful service. Uh, if you go 100% paid, the four million is going to pale in comparison to what you're going to end up having to pay countywide without doing significant reductions, uh, which no one wants to see. Uh, I don't. I don't believe anybody would say that. No, we need less staffing. We need less ambulances. We need less people. We're going to do less coverage. Um, nobody wants a 40, 50, 60 minute response time from the time they call 911 until an ambulance gets there. So. I guess the next topic that I'll address is the, the Lavelle Rescue Squad is very concerned come September 12th, are we going to still have staffing? Is the county going to pull out? What do we need to do? What, you know, what do we need to plan for? Because three weeks from the time, three weeks from the time I got the email until the deadline, we were supposed to make a decision that's going to determine the future of EMS in Lavelle and it's going to have ripple effects throughout the rest of the county. Director Piles, do you want to comment on that? I, I, I absolutely think we need to have a meeting between now and then, but if, if you, do you have any any comments on, on that, Jimmy? Yeah, Commissioner, thank you. <clears throat> the date was originally set on September 11th, which I apologize to you and your family. Tomorrow will be a letter to the editor explaining that away. There was no intent. 
I've been in public service my entire life. I apologize to you and the entire May family, and you will see that in the letter at the editor tomorrow. The discussions you had with Roger, you've indicated you need an extension. Do you think for a second that we would all of a sudden pull out? We have to have planning. We have to have, so we're, we're in talks, we're in negotiations for a one of a kind integration with you, the volunteers, and, and us, uh, DPS. So we're fully open to it. Your door, the date you'll see tomorrow is more, uh, the 18th. It's been moved a week ahead. That was a mistake on my part. And again, I'm sorry to you and your family. And then we we'll keep discussions with Roger as to the integrations, what we need to do, continue to low sat, and whatnot. So that's kind of where we're at. Okay. I appreciate that response. Thank Absolutely. you. Absolutely. Thank so, you, Director. Um, I, I, sorry. So, oh, no, Scott, and, and I, I just want to hear your opinion. 70 is too high. What do you think would be fair? You know, because, again, we're, we're kind of caught in the middle of two county employees running a call, and, and you know, what, what do you think is, is the fair rate, just you personally? Uh, certainly. So, um, as I said, our initial billing, whenever we went 24-7 with the county, the agreed upon rate was 50% of all net revenue. So that is all the money that we collect from insurance, from billing, 8% goes to medical claim aid, so we don't get any of that. Any reimbursements for overpayments, and you're an insurance guy, you know how that goes. Um, so whatever is left, 50% of that was what went to the county. It didn't matter who was on the call. If I had mm -hmm. two volunteers on the call and no DES personnel, DES still got 50%. If there was two DES personnel on the call and no volunteers, DES got 50%. If it was a mixed call, 50%. That, that's the way we worked. When I, went, when I met with Director Piles uh, last year when we were renegotiating, um, again, we came up initially with the 50%. Mm -hmm. We offered to go up to 60%, and that was still considered unacceptable. Um, I, I believe 60%, which I told him, was a good number to try for a year to see what that does to our budgets, see where that actually puts us, because there are a lot of expenses and there's a lot of moving parts in making the budgets work, <coughs> even on the small organization side, um, such as our organization. I can only imagine how it is on the county side, because uh, you guys have a lot more moving parts than what we do. Um, but it's one of those that you, you have to try a number to, to take a jump from 50 to 70 percent at, at one time with little to no notice it makes it very hard to budget or plan for um, it, it's no secret that you know we put out there we purchased two new ambulances last year that cost us half a million dollars and that half a million dollars came out of our fund reserves because we've been trying to save a little bit of money mm -hmm. back um, on an annual basis we clear about thirty thousand dollars give or take. Um, we take that money, we put it into savings so that it can uh, grow interest, and then whenever it comes time to purchase an ambulance or make another capital purchase, we use that fund for it. So that, that's a little bit of forecasting on our side. Um, so we're, we're not in it to make a profit. At the end of the day, I, I personally don't care about money, but money is what makes everything work. Um, so I, I firmly believe that there is a percentage out there that we can come to an agreement that it's not uh, it's not hurting the county. The county's not getting the short end of the stick, but at the same time, the volunteer system isn't getting the short end either. Um, Scott, uh, yes. so um, you you're you're saying that you don't think that it could not or should not necessarily be be like a staggered rate, depending on who and who, who may not be on the call necessarily. I, I'm, you, not you know what I mean? I'm not opposed to a staggered rate. Just ask. Um, we just, our billing was not initially set up like that. We're on that staggered rate now. Um, everybody in the county has moved to the new staggered rate as of August 1st. We were not on that. We were a trial that um, the previous director, DeVore, was attempting to set up to see how this would work. Um, again, our percentage of the calls that we were 100% handling on our own was a small enough percentage that we weren't going to fight over staggered rates. We felt a nice even number. Um, that also alleviates the amount of time that's required in figuring out was the call run by DES, was it run by volunteers, was it run by both, so what billing percentage do we need, and uh, the, the current way that it's done when you're billing on that per call basis, every single call is a line item. So somebody has to sit down, get a list of all of those calls, make sure they're all billed out appropriately, figure out what kind of money's come back in from the insurance companies, 
and then figure out the percentages. That takes a lot of time. On our flat rate, it was at the end of our audit cycle, this is what our number was. We cut it in half and that, that it made it easier for us. We made four quarterly payments based on that. Sure. Okay. Any, anything else for? No. All right. Hey, thank you very much. Thanks, thank you, John. gentlemen. Okay. Appreciate it. Um, next up, Mr. John something. Starts with an S. Shoehart. Shoehart. <laughs> oh. It's, it's Linda's cursive, I think. I'm sorry. She's <laughs> fancy. Yeah, I. <laughs> John Shuhart, 18926 High Street, Barton. <clears throat> I'm a little nervous. <laughs> I'm going to make it a lot easier on you guys because you had your ears burned all night. <laughs> Mine is regard to LOSAP. As you know, most of the companies, well, us old folks, we don't run calls anymore. <laughs> so we're not earning points. And the county has a 50 point limit to earn one year qualification for LOSAP. Can they do something like Hartford County did and award one point to everyone for this year? Or could they prorate it? We've been out of business for four and a half, five months. 50 points comes out to 4.2 points a month. Five times 4.2 minus 50. That's what you need for qualification for this year. Sure. It's something we'd have to look into and talk to the actuary behind the scenes on LOSAP to see if that's, that's a change we can make to the plan, mm -hmm. whether it be temporary or permanent. So yeah. we can certainly go ask the question. Can I say here tonight if we can do it? I don't know yet. Is that I've, I've also presented this to the legislatures for the state of Maryland, and this involves the income tax incentive. And Correct. It remains to be seen what they will be doing but it's yes. something I just wanted to throw out for not only Barton, but all member companies in Allegheny County. It's something we could certainly look at, and maybe <laughs> it's something we could follow suit if the General Assembly does take action. Maybe that's something the commissioners could sort of follow along with. Well, the General Assembly, I think, will not be quite as lenient as <laughs> yeah. we, awarding we, one point for we, we every can. prior member and any new member that may come in this year. Was that specific to this year because of the issues, sir, or was it? With the coronavirus. Issue? Yes, sir. Yes. Okay, thank you. We, we, we can take a look at it. I mean, we it's, can, it, it's just, yeah. we can't, it, it, it's more involved than just us up here. Right, as yeah, you I know, realize so. that, but I have not heard anything in the county or anything about it in the state, and I thought, well, get something started. It, and, it, it, yeah, and it's it's certainly something that's, that's one more cost for us so we'll have to look at it, what kind of cost well, there might be it won't that. cost you any more if you don't take any new ones in plus the ones that have died you don't have to pay for them so your finances should basically balance out itself for cost per well, year we can we can talk to our actuary about it unfortunately there's a lot of moving parts within that i so. realize that i've been in this for 20 years with the points coordinator and mm -hmm. Great. Fighting over establishing <laughs> low, low sap, and <laughs> but I just appreciate your cooperation. Great, thank you. Thank Thanks, you. John. Thanks, John. Okay, uh, and, lo uh, and last we have Ms. Valerie Felker. First of all, sitting here as a citizen, I want to thank all you guys. I'm quite frightened sitting in this meeting. I depend on you. I'm not here about the ambulance. I'm here about, I have a question. I'll make it short. I was here before. There was not enough community support to stop the issue that I'd like to speak about tonight. I brought pictures. And I guess what I'm here is quite selfish, the reason I'm here. I prepared just a short statement because I don't want to get emotional. 
and I am emotional after all this tonight. Oh my goodness. Okay, first of all, I'd like to thank council for allowing me to speak. I would like you all to see the progress of the solar site across from my property. I totally understand that there's not enough community support to stop the said site. Now, my only reason for being here tonight is to seek advice from council. As you know, your home is one of your biggest investments, okay? I have... I bought my home in 2016, I've made improvements, I continue to make improvements. And my question is, um, I just want to upgrade a directive for my children as to which, if, I'm not, if I don't sell the property before I pass away, and the directive with my will and such, which type of realtor are my children to contact? Are they to contact a commercial realtor or an industrial realtor? Because my property is no longer a residential property. That is my front yard you're looking at. And you gentlemen just were in this said site of rescue, a helicopter rescue. You pulled someone out of the woods off of Williams Road in March and is now a solar panel site. That's my distress. And that's, I live up on the top of, I live on the knob. That's over in the hollow. And they don't even have the solar panels in yet. So that's my question. I'm being selfish. I want to know how do I, what directive do I give my children on my passing? Ma'am, so this was this was, this was a situation where I, I believe you're, you're zoning. You're zoned. Are you you're zoned agricultural out there? I believe so. Residential agricultural. Correct. So so in this instance, if I recall correctly, the the solar farm did have to go through the uh, the board of zoning appeals. Correct, yes, uh, I was had, a had hearings on that. At the proposal, uh, correct. And there was not enough community support and, and, and to they stop all, it. And, and did they, all, they had a, a PSC hearing as well, the Public Service Commission as well, and both of those entities approved the special exceptions for for this being put in the, the residential or... The I, I, think, I, think you're, I think you're it's agriculture. It's a farm yeah. You, you, yeah, you're in the A. Yeah, that's yeah. a farm lot. That's a big farming field. Yeah, unfortunately, it's a situation where you know, we, we have the, the, the county and the state have set up these these boards, the, the zoning boards and the public service commissions to, to look at specifically projects like this that, that don't necessarily fit into the, uh, the standard for your, your area, uh, your, your zoned agricultural. Uh, but, but when the zoning board and, and the public service commission heard this, they, they granted the special exceptions necessary to, to allow that sort of a project, taking into consideration, uh, you know, the, the impact on the community. And unfortunately, in, in this situation, it's, it was, it was a situation where the, the zoning board and the, the PSC found that that was a valid, a valid special exception. So you're still, you're still in the agricultural district, but, but I. I, I see the pictures. I, I understand That's not stress. finished yet. Sure. That was just Monday. It starts in the morning, and by the afternoon, I already have a bright glare. I realize it's only me up on that hill. Most other people, as was stated in the newspaper, the company is going to be putting trees and such around. That's not going to help me, but I'm only one person. But the thing is, I'm looking at the value of my property. I mean, I, I'm in the forestry program. I'm cleaning up this property. I'm investing, and I do volunteer. I don't know he remembers me, but I volunteer also. I've only been here four years. I know I was brought up with civic pride. But I'm telling you, I, I'm just upset about the investment I made in this community and how I feel that I'm losing. I mean, it's 2008 again. Uh, your home is a big investment. So you're telling me that my taxes haven't changed and my zoning hasn't changed so that you tell my children I mean, you're you're you're, st you're still in the agricultural you're still in the agricultural area. Yeah, you know, the 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 zoning board and the public service commission would have just made a special exception to allow to allow that yeah, in there for the taxes, which is stagnant tax. Thank you, thank you very much. Ms. Felder, would you like your? Yes. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. That's the field y'all need a rescue. It's now so. Okay. Um, our next public business meeting will be Thursday, September 10th, 5 o'clock. Um, if, if you would be interested, um, our, our EMS folks, um, I, I think we should pick either a daytime or nighttime. Is that what works best for, for most people? We can talk about that afterwards. 
Um, we'll decide amongst ourselves who wants to be there, because I do think commissioners need to be there as well, represented. And uh, we'll, we'll I, I think I think we just need to get everyone from DES and, and you guys in the same room and uh, and kind of go from there. Um, Director Piles, do you have anything else that you wanted to add or any of your staff? Because I, I know you all were, were here for the whole, whole uh, presentation tonight. Good evening, commissioners. Good evening, Mr. Bennett, Mr. Beaton, Ms. Linda, members of the media, ladies and gentlemen. 20 years ago, I was promoted to the rank of sergeant and was transferred to Baltimore City, commanding a squad on the streets of Baltimore City. 20 years ago, I was exposed to crime-driven data. The last 20 years, I've used data to make some hard decisions. 20 years ago, exposed to data and used it as a detective sergeant, as a lieutenant, as a captain, as a major, chief of police in my current position. Looked at data, time, distance, and safety. Where are we? Are we in the right place? Can we get there quicker? Did mapping for 5, 10, 15, 20 minutes. Did overlay mapping. Are we better? Are we, can we be faster uh, with the locations we're at? Then I looked at the budget. I looked at billing. And the billing made no sense to me. We had meeting after meeting after meeting after meeting to include our auditors on the billing. So when you look at the billing, a system was recreated 13 years ago to supplement the volunteers. 13 years later, that billing system's never changed. And in some locations, we've replaced the volunteers. For example, when you look at the end of year report 2019, Bowman's edition, our provider was on 91% of the calls. Corganville, 89% of the calls. Crescentown, 84% of the calls. LaVale, 96% of the calls. And Tritown's 85% of the calls. When you look at the revenue for Allegheny County per call, it's $87, $87 per call. So I formed an EMS billing committee. And the committee was formed probably on or about June. And I gave a deadline of December 15th. The committee was asked three things. Can you give me a recommendation for ALS, BLS? Can you give me a recommendation for ALS only? And give me a recommendation for BLS only? The first individual, and also asked for everybody's profit and loss statements. The first individual walked in my office, uh, BLS provider laid his profit and loss statement down and said, I think BLS should start at 50%. Seems fair to me. December 15th passed, no recommendation from the billing committee. I had a second meeting with the billing committee. Gave them an overview, again, where we need to be, where we need to go, and COVID hit. So myself, like everybody, we were doing Zoom calls, we were busy, we were dealing things, and I realized that COVID impacted the billing committee. But the current billing structure is not fair to our taxpayers. It's not fair to the overall system that has been provided. Commissioners, in 2017, you declared a state of emergency on EMS in Allegheny County. There was a time where it was about a 25% failure rate. That, that, that failure rate is less than 4%. So I want to thank you for what you've done, the funding you've done. I don't know how you've done it, but you've make it, made it work every day. We will reconvene with everybody, and I heard 65% to 60% for ALS, BLS uh, providers. So we will reconvene, we'll get an answer, and we'll get back to you. Uh, but thank you again for everything you've done for EMS in Allegheny County. It's going to be a better place whenever we're done with, with the EMS system. Thank you. Okay. Let, let's get that meeting the next week or so, um, certainly before September 11th. All right. Okay. Anything else, gentlemen? No. I just wanted to thank everybody for being here tonight. Yeah. I mean, that's part of, you know, how we work together. You heard a lot of great positive comments, and I think we want to get to a place that we have an effective and efficient system that works for everybody. So uh, we're going to keep, keep trying to work through this. Well said, Commissioner. Uh, Mr. Mr. Wilmot, let, let's, let's get you afterwards, okay? We, we, we had enough people signed up to speak tonight, oh, so, okay. so we'll... we'll, we'll... Just, just about, about two seconds. 